yes good morning once again and um, uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer all right um, maybe we can have one of the students pray for us uh if we could have charles pray for us please all right can you hear me oh yes all right let's breathe and pray even father we are thankful this wonderful morning to say thank you for bringing us together again we thank you uh, that you have programmed this to happen before the time was paid you knew it and that we would be meeting for this important uh, topic about the book of john as we study the book of john oh lord Yes, he stayed with you. He knew you. He was speaking from the true evidence. He touched you. He stayed with you. And Lord, we pray that through that, we'll be able to stay with you in the spiritual realm and be able to understand you fully and be able to even give that information to the people that you have given us that we are shepherding. We thank you that we are here. We pray for connections, that the internet will be stable and that the gadgets will be fully charged and will learn exactly what you wanted us to get. For the glory of your name and the good of your people, for in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Charles. Uh, we'll begin. So we have now covered uh, in our uh, study of John up to John chapter 7. So we would now be moving into John's, uh, John chapters 8 and 9 today. Uh, our goal is to finish these two. So uh, we would actually begin with uh, John chapter 7 verse 53 because if you were to see, you know, in most of your Bibles, um, the John chapter 7 ends uh, with verse 52. And then when they begin chapter 8, they tend to put the last verse of the previous chapter here uh, with, uh, you know, John chapter 8. And um, some Bibles will even put the uh, this first portion of chapter 8 in brackets. Um, and then there would be a you know footnote down below with an explanation about why they have placed that particular portion in brackets uh, so we are dealing with that controversial passage right now so john chapter 7 verse 53 uh, up to john chapter 8 verse 11 which would be the passage of the woman uh, who was accused of adultery and uh, who is brought before jesus for judgment okay so um, this is the passage that we are dealing with and um, as it is explained in the footnote of some of our Bibles, and also as it is explained in many commentaries, um, this um, particular passage, they say, uh, is not present in many of the very early Greek manuscripts which have been found. Uh, so some people wonder whether this is really inspired scripture or whether this is just something that was added later on. So. Um, um, there's a slight doubt regarding whether this should be accepted as a historical event that really took place or not, uh, because the most ancient um, manuscripts that we have available to us today, uh, many of them do not mention this particular passage. And um, there are some later manuscripts where it is mentioned, but again, they too use brackets or asterisk marks uh, to kind of indicate that there is uh, some um, level of doubt regarding this passage. Also, there are some manuscripts where we have this particular passage being included somewhere else um, in the Gospels. Uh, so uh, there's one manuscript where we have it, uh, this particular passage of the lady caught in adultery. It's mentioned after Luke chapter 21. And... Um, uh, in, in other manuscripts, it's mentioned after John chapter 21 and uh, or maybe John chapter 7 in, in, one, in one manuscript. So uh, these are all uh, things which raise a doubt regarding the uh, historicity of this particular 
passage. Now, um, what should we conclude? Should we take this as uh, an incident that really took place? Or should we uh, dismiss it as something that um, somebody just came up with a story that someone came up with, uh, thinking it would uh, sound nice? You know, because there were many other writings about uh, Jesus' time, and um, you know, these were written even later in the second century uh, and even beyond that. So, should we take it as that kind of a story, or should we accept it as a historical reality? Now, nobody really knows. Um, because um, there's no evidence, uh, so we don't, we cannot 100% uh, say that this did take place. But at the same time, we cannot deny uh, and say no, no, no. We know for sure that this is a false passage. Uh, we cannot say that either. So um, my personal opinion regarding this, um, in this passage, we don't see Jesus saying or doing anything which is. Uh, contrary to the things which he says and does in the rest of the Gospels. So it is quite possible that this passage is accurate. Um, he um, he stays in character. You know, the words that he speaks, the actions that he does is very much in line with uh, the way see, we see him uh, operating in all of the other Gospels. So yes, it's, it is quite likely that this uh, passage is historically accurate and uh, these are this is an incident which actually took place on the other hand if someone says how can we really accept this because uh, the earliest manuscripts do not mention it if someone were to say that again it's not really a loss uh, because the things that jesus says and does in this passage he says and does those things even in other uh, you know um, um other passages which have historical backing uh, for instance, here he turns the tables on the uh, you know uh, leaders, the scribes who have come to trap him. He turns the tables very successfully upon them. Um, he shows mercy to a person um, who has been living an immoral life, and he gives her a second chance. We see him doing that in other Bible uh, passages as well. Uh, we see him as a, as a as a God who reaches out to the sinful and um, you know tells them not to live in sin any longer but to change their ways so we see him doing that in other passages as even if someone says no no we should not look at this passage at all it is not such a great loss because the things that he says and does in this particular passage he has said those things he has done those things even in other passages okay so we would probably have to leave it at that uh, because uh, nobody has any um, you know clear uh, proof regarding this particular passage uh, this one thing that some people say they say that the writing style of this particular passage seems to be a little different from the rest of this book of john um, for instance they talk about how uh, when they accuse you know the people who want to trap jesus the leaders who want to trap jesus when they come over here uh, to meet him they address him as teacher. And uh, so they say, in the book of John, it's always the disciples who address Jesus as a uh, teacher. And Nicodemus, you know, who had begun to believe in him and who was hoping for confirmation that he is really the Messiah, when he comes, he too addresses Jesus as teacher. Uh, but in the book of John, nobody else ever addresses Jesus as a teacher. So they say maybe it is some, somebody else who wrote this particular portion. OK, so these are all just technicalities um, that they bring up. But um, most scholars accept the fact uh, that uh, this is scripturally accurate and inspired um, uh, simply because uh, even in uh, the later manuscripts where uh, they were not sure whether to include it or not, they did include it uh, and put, put an asterisk mark or a bracket or something over there to indicate that there is some slight uh, doubt regarding it. But they did not want to just do away with it because they felt that this is a true passage. They did not want people to miss out on the teaching which can emerge from this passage. Uh, they were very reluctant to just discard it. So it, we see it preserved. We see this particular passage preserved in so many uh, manuscripts in spite of the fact that, that they're putting a bracket over there. So um, when they felt so strongly that this probably is 
true, um, maybe it's quite all right for us to accept it as a um, historical accurate uh, passage. So coming to the the passage itself, um, we will just quickly go through um, you know the, the verses um, and see what we can learn. So if we could have maybe one person uh, read out for us uh, John chapter 7 verse 53 up to John chapter 8 verse 6. Yeah, I think that would be good. 753 up to 8, 6. Uh, uh, before we get into the passage as such, I'm so sorry. It's just that I forgot last time to mention this. And I did not want to repeat the mistake again. Uh, because once we start oh, with the passage, everything else just goes out of my mind. Uh, this is regarding the assessments. Um, the first assessment will be posted next week. So just kind of keep an eye. You know, uh, those of you who are on the e platform and who will be looking at this video later, um, you would get a notification in your e platform saying that assessment one has been posted, uh, you know, which would be multiple choice questions. Uh, so um, you will get a notification. The same for uh, those of us who are right now in the Google Classroom. Um, I will be putting it in the stream page, you know, the notification saying that now the assessment one has been posted. and um, you will get about two weeks to do it. Uh, so that would be more than enough time. OK, so uh, uh, no hassles. Uh, it will not be difficult at all. And you just have to tick the correct answer. So uh, sometime, either this weekend or next week, um, depending on you know how things go for me with my schedule, uh, I will be posting it. OK, so without fail, if not over the weekend, at least by uh, next week, mid midweek, it will be there. So uh, you can take a look at the assessment one and uh, just tick the correct answer as it's all just multiple choice. OK, so with that out of the way and you know, another thing that I really wanted to say, uh, you know, many of you have posted wishes for uh, Teachers Day uh, in the stream page. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, thank you. So yes, uh, let's get back into uh, John. Uh, if someone could read out this passage for us, please. John chapter 7, verse 53, to chapter 8 of verse 6. Yes. It reads, And everyone went to his own house. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees, brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. All right. OK, so uh, it says very clearly in verse 6, uh, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. So uh, most prob probably uh, they were hoping that things would go in a particular way um, where Jesus would probably want to show mercy. They have seen Jesus uh, track record. Um, he's been very friendly with people who you know have still not got their act together, even though they have been living in sin. He has been reaching out to them in love. And he has been, you know, giving them uh, a, a second chance rather than just speaking judgment upon them immediately. He has advised them to go forth and sin no more. And uh, he, he, you know, has given them uh, another chance to repent and turn to God. So there's a chance that even here in this particular case, he will probably want to, you know, show mercy to the lady caught in adultery. And if, if he does that, if he takes that route, um, they want to be able to accuse him and say, ha, 
which means you are not following the law of Moses. You who consider yourself a teacher of the law, you are not following the law of Moses. They can, you know, take that line of accusation. On the other hand, he says, yeah, you know, we need to respect the law of Moses and obey it. So let's go ahead and stone her. If he were to take that route, then they would be able to get him into trouble with the uh, Roman garment um, because the um, uh, Romans uh, had not given Jews the permission to execute people, except in in one or two cases where there's very serious temple violation. So uh, the Roman government has allowed them that little bit of leniency, where when it comes to very serious temple violations, like someone actually going into the Holy of Holies or something really atrocious like that, then you are allowed to uh, give a death sentence. The Jews, the Jewish leaders are allowed to give a death sentence in such a case. But generally, no, they are not uh, allowed to um, to kill anyone on religious grounds. So if Jesus says, let us go ahead and you know fulfill the law of Moses by stoning her, then they can uh, use that as an accusation and uh, get him into trouble with the Roman law. So this is the trap which they set for him. Um, and um, one point which people generally make regarding this uh, particular story, they point out that it is only the lady who is brought, uh, whereas the man who participated in the adultery, he is not brought over there. Uh, he is just allowed to, you know, uh, to, to just leave, escape uh, judgment. So. Um, most probably they did not bring him because like it says very clearly in verse 6, this was meant to be a trap, which means uh, they would have requested the man to participate in this conspiracy. And if he is brought over there and if he opens his mouth, uh, then uh, you know their entire game would be up. So um, because it's something which they have generated, a conspiracy which they have set up, uh, they do not want the man over there. Uh, they do not want Jesus cr cross-questioning him uh, and exposing the truth. So uh, they do not produce the man. The man is just allowed to uh, escape and leave. Um, on the other hand, the lady, of course, is produced uh, because she's the pawn that they are using uh, to capture him, if in case they are able to capture him. So um, we see that. And... Uh, the verse now, verse six, uh, is interesting uh, because we see uh, what Jesus' response is to this trap which has been laid out for him. So it says in the last part of verse six, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. So what is Jesus' response? His response is literally zero. He doesn't even bother, um, you know, uh, addressing their question. He just continues doing whatever it is that he was doing. Um, now there are a lot of, um, you know, I don't know, um, lot of explanations given for this, and everyone has a right to their own opinion. Uh, simply because, again, we do not know what he wrote. If, he, if we knew what he was writing, then we could maybe say something specific. Uh, but then uh, we, as we, as it's not revealed over here in this in this passage as to what exactly he was writing on the ground, uh, we, um, you know, will have to come up with our own conclusions. Uh, so um, this is my opinion regarding this. Um, I believe that uh, you know, at dawn it says in verse one, at at verse 2, it says, At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. So Jesus came over there uh, to teach the people, and the people were eager to hear, and so they have come and they have gathered around him, and so the teaching session begins. And then when the teaching session is going on, these people come to lay their trap. So I believe that Jesus was just continuing to do what he was doing. Uh, you know, he was writing on the ground something that he wanted them to see, something that he wanted to teach. Um, for instance, I mean, um, when I was a child and my father would teach me mathematics, you know, he would not just explain with words. He would take paper and pen and start writing down all those digits over there and then show me how to do my multiplication and my you know division and all of that. So uh, we demonstrate, you know, we, we write it out so that people see what is being written and they learn. 
So Jesus had come over there to teach. And I think he was in the process of writing down on the ground so that people would read what he is saying and so that he can explain those things better to them. Uh, for the simple reason that back then, uh, they did not have whiteboards. Uh, they did not have PowerPoint presentations. Um, so, and using a papyrus to you know write down and explain would have been a highly expensive thing because uh, those papyrus uh, rolls were very, very expensive. And uh, Jesus was not a rich person, uh, you know. So he would have just written down on the ground, uh, you know, maybe that particular portion of whatever verse he's teaching them. And then they would be able to read it and memorize it. You know, the, the people who, are, who have come there to learn would read those words and memorize it. So I think here Jesus is just deliberately ignoring these people and the question that they have come up with. He They ask uh, their question and it says, but Jesus, bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger, completely ignoring them. And they don't know what to do. So they go on pestering him. Verse 7 says, uh, when they kept on questioning him, then you know he straightens up and then he says one sentence to them. OK, so uh, we see that. Um, so um, maybe we can have someone read out verses 7 and 8, please. Verse 7 and 8. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Okay, so Jesus does not have anything much to say on this issue. You know, he just has one sentence to say, and then he again stoops down and continues with his work. All right. So um, he um, knows the intentions of their heart. And so it's a very clever sentence that he comes up with. You know, so he says, anyone who is without sin, which actually is an unfortunate translation, uh, it doesn't really bring out the word which is used over there, uh, because the word that is used over there is whoever is blameless. Okay, whoever is without fault, let him throw the first stone. So for us to understand what on earth is Jesus talking about, who is who, the, a person who is blameless, a person who is without fault, he should throw the first stone. What on earth is Jesus talking about? He's just basically uh, telling them what they already know from the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, you know, they, these people who have come over here to lay the trap would have done their reading up on the Old Testament scriptures on what are the exact laws regarding adultery and what are the procedures regarding punishment. So I'm sure they've done their homework and come and they're well aware of what scriptures Jesus is referring to. So we who are not that familiar with these things would have to take a look at that. So if we could have one person read out Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 16 to 18, please. Deuteronomy 19 verses 16 to 18, where it talks about uh, you know, uh, the kind of witnesses who should be bringing an accusation. Deuteronomy 19, verses 16 to 18 says, If a false witness rises against any man to testify against him of wrongdoing, then both men in the controversy shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who serve in those days. And the judges shall make careful inquiry, and indeed, if the witness is a false witness who has testified falsely against his brother. Yeah. OK, so uh, here it's talking about how uh, there should be no false testimony involved. So you should have blameless witnesses bringing charges. All right. So if they if they are saying that we had they have witnessed uh, this sinful crime and they want to bring charges against the accused, they should be a true witness. They should not be a false witness. And uh, so Jesus says, let you, anyone any of you who is blameless, who is a genuine true witness let that person you know start off the proceedings by throwing the first stone 
um, now it's ironic uh, because I mean uh, Jesus knows what kind of witnesses they are. This is something that they have planned beforehand. So they are not genuinely coming over here out of concern for the righteousness of God. Uh, this is a trap which they have set. So he knows what kind of witnesses they all are. They are witnesses who have schemed and conspired against him, and now they are over here. Now, Jesus is not saying that this lady has not uh, participated in the adultery. He's very much aware of the fact that she has committed a sin. So he is not saying that uh, they are bringing a false story. He is talking about what kind of witnesses are they on the inside? With what motive have they come over there? Uh, so he says, anyone who is, you know, who is blameless, who is genuinely a true witness, let him begin the proceedings. So now you see he's turned the tables. Now it's uh, they wanted him to say something or do something. Now he's saying, okay, fine, you go ahead and you say you do, you know what needs to be done now. So now the people who are standing over there, ready to you know see how Jesus responds, they are in a tight spot. Um, they 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 are in the same tight spot into which they wanted to put Jesus. Now if they actually you know begin to stone her. Uh, they could get themselves into a lot of trouble with the Romans. On the other hand, if, you know, if they say, ah, no, it's OK, let's you know, leave it, uh, then that same accusation can be made against them saying, oh, they are disobeying and ignoring the law of Moses. So now it's their turn to act. Jesus has you know, said, now the ball is in your court. You go ahead. You know, the first or the one who is the most genuine witness, start the proceedings, get going. And now they do not know what to do. And uh, so we see the response in verse 9. If we can have one person read out verse 9, please. Could I have someone uh, read out verse 9, please? Verse 9. Yes. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the, to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. I really don't think the original um, wording had the words whose conscience was touched or something like that. Uh, that probably is the you know English translation trying to bring out, um, trying to explain the passage, um, because it um, just says those who heard you know uh, they began to go away one at a time. Um, so that portion about their consciences being pricked, uh, that is. I mean, if you, we can just look it up in Bible Hub, you know, um, I think most of you are familiar with that. It's a free software. You just go to Bible Hub and you type in your scripture and you ask for the, uh, you know, the, uh, the original Greek and it would show up there. And I'm pretty sure there's no word, uh, you know, about conscience or anything like that mentioned in the original. So it's just basically those who heard began to go away one at a time. And the older ones are the first ones to leave. Because I'm assuming that the older ones, the elders, would be the ones who, have, who would have mainly uh, come up with the whole scheme. So now they realize that their scheme has flopped. Uh, so they you know, leave the scene. And then uh, the rest of them, well, with the leaders gone, what do you do? You know, so they also leave. Um, so I'm assuming that's basically how the you know, story ends. And then uh, Jesus is left uh, standing there alone with the um, with the woman, uh, yeah. Now, you know, if uh, Shay has uh, raised a hand, uh, please go ahead, brother. Yeah. Yes, Ma. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know if this would be a diversion, but you mentioned that in the time, at this time when this story happened, um, it was unlawful for the Jews to stone anyone. I'm also just fast forwarding. To Stephen, what happened? Why then did they stone Stephen if the Roman Empire was still, you know, in charge at that time? So I, I, I just wanted to get clarity on that. Or was it that that was a greater punishment and they were allowed to do that? Or what was just the difference? Just for clarity. 
I really do not know at all. Uh, I, you know, this is just me <laughs> making assumptions. Uh, you know, when uh, Jesus um, rose from the dead and uh, all this talk began to go around that uh, he has risen from the dead after three days and uh, it was uh, it, it it created quite a stir and uh, we have all these secular writings you know uh, where you have secular historians uh, recording this later on uh, maybe about 50 years 60 years even 100 years later in their historical records where they talk about how these the followers of this christus you know is the term that they use the greek uh, name uh, the followers of this christus have started off this uh, this myth about how their uh, you know uh, um, their leader was raised from the dead and they are creating havoc everywhere and uh, so uh, for all of these secular historians uh, the way they write their uh, uh, writings uh, they, they, they regard these christians as a as a as troublemakers who are creating confusion and disruption so a lot happened after the resurrection um, the entire uh, uh, thing, nation of Israel was shaken up and for the Romans this was like a, a, a very, um, a, a, they didn't really know how to deal with the situation and uh, so you uh, you have Jews you know rising up in certain places and, and uh, you know uh, beginning to attack the Christians saying you know you liars uh, look at the you know uh, the fake stories that you're coming up with and uh, then the Romans would have to quickly go over there and you know um, um, bring calm to the whole situation so a lot was happening uh, and um, uh, uh, things were rather volatile uh, so in that scenario uh, is when uh, Stephen's stoning happens uh, so uh, at that time, uh, there was a lot of communication between the emperor and the officers, the Roman officials, you know, stationed over here in Israel, uh, where uh, in uh, we have, uh, I really, I mean, I'm not prepared for this, so I, I don't really remember the details. Uh, you have one emperor who responds and says, you know, don't go too far, don't get too strict with these um, with all these riots, you know, be lenient, uh, be considerate. Uh, is, 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 is the in, uh, is the letter which one emperor sends to the official stationed over here. On the other hand, you have another emperor who writes saying, you know, I'm very glad that you're taking strict measures. You know, uh, if if they need to be killed, go ahead and kill them. So a um, lot of confusion is happening over here. Civil unrest is going on over here in this nation suddenly, and the Romans don't know how to control the situation. And the officials, the top officials, are desperately sending letters uh, to the top management uh, in Rome asking for advice on what to do, how to proceed. And the uh, emperor is sending back letters saying, you know, do this, do that. So that, uh, so in that kind of a, a scenario, uh, Stephen's stoning happens where things have already started getting out of control. But before that, you know, in Jesus' times, things were still uh, calm, quiet. The unrest began with Jesus coming. Up to then, things were very much under control and things were peaceful. With Jesus coming, of course, the unrest has already begun because you have people saying, oh, he is the Messiah. We have to accept what he says. And then there are others who are kind of getting, uh, you know, um, and they're, they're saying, no, 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 uh, how can he be the Messiah? And uh, so already there is a little bit of unrest going on, but things are still quite under control as far as the Roman admin and the Roman law and order is concerned. So they would have been more careful about you know, picking up stones and stoning someone. But after the resurrection, things got really uh, difficult because the Jews, the Jewish leaders can literally feel their hold slipping away. I mean, they were in power. They were in, uh, in a very good position where nobody could say anything to them. And, uh, you know, things were going really well. But now you have these Christians rising up and uh, a lot of people are now believing in what they are preaching about the gospel and people are turning to Jesus and uh, the Jews are just losing their power, their position. And so they began to really stir up the crowds, trying to, you know, um, um, cause unrest, uh, trying to cause, um, you know, these riots and all of that. And uh, so uh, 
they were desperate they were no longer thinking about how will the romans react you know right now their immediate thing is let's do whatever it takes to get back into power and stay in power and just subdue these christians because many of them are not very influential maybe we can just subdue them and finish them off so a rather wrong explanation sorry but i am just thinking stoning when things were peaceful would have had much greater implications so that i would have been afraid to take the step but after the resurrection when things got really hot uh, at that time they would not have been that careful about whom they are stoning why they are stoning which is why poor paul gets beaten up and you know ill treated so many times and the law really doesn't do much to help him uh, um so there was a lot of civil unrest after uh, the resurrection <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much, Pastor. I, and I just wanted to add, I, I kind of, as you were talking, support what you're saying because um, even the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the report of the Romans was actually falsified alongside with the Jewish leaders. So there must have been a good cooperation between the Romans and then the Jewish leaders in actually taking out of the Christians, you know, just taking them off the scene. So yes, I, I thank you so much for your explanation. I, I do support what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, it's true. No, I mean, they both had a common goal. The Romans wanted peace. They wanted things uh, back to normal. And of course, the Jews definitely wanted things going back to normal so that they can hold on to their power and continue as they were earlier. Yes. Um, all right. So um, yeah, so for you finally have the last uh, two verses, 10 and 11. Uh, where Jesus says, uh, has no one condemned you? Uh, no one, sir, she said, then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Uh, so he does not condemn her. He does not judge her and uh, speak judgment upon her immediately, just like in the Old Testament and just like in all the earlier um, you know, passages which we saw in the other Gospels. Um, uh, we see that Jesus is willing to give a second chance to, to people to repent. So why does he not condemn her? Because he, he is giving her a chance to repent. Uh, he is definitely not saying that he supports what she is doing. No, he is not supporting her sinful behavior. He is just giving her a second chance uh, to change her ways. And so he advises her, go now and leave your life of sin. Uh, yes. Uh, did someone wanted to want to raise a question? Because I just heard a voice. Um, no. All right. We will go ahead. Oh yes. We'll come to the passage, um, uh, verse twelve onwards. Uh, if you see, uh, you know, in the previous uh, chapter, we were looking at the feast of tabernacles, where you had the water being poured out on the altar every day during the feast. You know, as a reminder of how uh, the God provided them with water in the wilderness. And Jesus rises up and says, you know, I am the living waters. Yes, Moses once upon a time, you know, uh, interceded on your behalf and water was given to you in a miraculous way. But that was just physical water. I, on the other hand, can give you eternal waters. And Jesus declares, you know, uh, that I am the living waters. Now here, that same story is continuing because this is uh, this uh, incident of the woman in ad adultery has been kind of you know um, thrust in over here, uh, and it's not exactly the right place. Which is why you know some manuscripts try to put it at the end of the Gospel of John because at least over there it doesn't clash with the timeline and you know, with the with the storyline. Uh, so um, here in verse twelve onwards, you have the Feast of Tabernacles thing going on. It's continuing. And uh, so now, uh, we, the water part, uh, Jesus has referred to. Now we come to the light part, um, you know, where it talks about the light. And uh, if we could have one person read out verse 12. John chapter 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Yes. So the Feast of Tabernacles had a lot of uh, very lovely ceremonies attached to it. One of them, of course, was the pouring out of the water onto the altar each day as a reminder. The other was this uh, uh, setting up of these uh, large, um, um, what do you call them? 
lamps is it i mean lamps doesn't really explain it they call them menorahs in the, you know in the modern english you know that uh, the lamp with those seven stems um which they would light up and uh, now these were not exactly normal uh, lamps uh, you know which you can place on a table these were 75 feet in height four of them with all the you know uh, uh, li lights lit up i mean the candles would have been lit up and so the they would um, be rather high in height and uh, probably each candle would not just be a candle but you know a real flame uh, you know a, a very large flame so this would really brighten up the entire temple area so um, so this is something that they would light up those four large huge candles would be lit up um, and this would be a reminder to the people of how in the uh, in during the wild their wilderness journey the lord had led them as a pillar of uh, light you know so this was supposed to be a reminder of that so now here jesus is saying um, you know yes at that time when your ancestors came out of um, egypt uh, the lord led you through a pillar of light but now i myself have come as the light of the world so whoever follows me will never walk in darkness back then in the wilderness uh, they were kept from stumbling they were kept from going in the wrong direction by that pillar of fire which was there to light up the way and now jesus is saying i'm i'm doing the same thing for you you know i can do the same thing for you if you will believe in me and follow me so he says those who follow me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life uh, he will give them the correct direction to go in he will keep them from stumbling and falling he will uh, expose the, uh, the 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 wrong things which, which are there inside them so that they can correct them and rectify them so he will be their light if they choose to follow him and it's also um, you know um interesting on um, one point which was there in your textbook about the connection between the word and the light um so um it, it, it says in your textbook um since jesus is the word it makes perfect sense that he is also the light uh, because in john 1 1 uh, jesus is established as the word okay he was the word and he was with god and he was god so jesus is the word and the old testament clearly explains to us what the word does you know this whole light aspect that the word has uh, because in psalm 119 uh, verse 105 it talks about how your word god's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path so um, and also in psalm 43 3 it talks about how uh, you know uh, how the uh, psalmist is crying out and saying send out your light and your truth so the light and the truth, the light and the word, they go together. Um, it is through the word that God lights up the path for us. It is through his instructions that he keeps us from stumbling. Uh, so in that sense, the word and the light go together. So now here Jesus is declaring and saying, I am that light. I am that word which can light up your life and keep you from stumbling. Therefore, follow me. And of course, the Pharisees do not want to do that. And uh, so they begin their arguments once again. Um, OK, we are kind of um, running out of time. Uh, if we could, if one of us could read out verses 13 and 14, please. Verse 13 and 14. So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourselves. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. Yes. So, uh they say, ha, your, the, the, the accusation which the uh, Pharisees make is, you know, you're saying that you're the light, that you're equal to the pillar, uh, you know, that let, uh, lit up the path for us back then. But this is just your testimony. These are just your words. Uh, you don't have anyone else backing, you, uh, backing up what you are saying. And uh, earlier when that kind of an accusation was 
indicated at that time in chapter 5 jesus says you know i do have three witnesses who can testify that what i am saying is true over here he does not refer immediately to those witnesses he just says even if there were no witnesses i have every right to you know declare this by myself uh, because of where i am from because of who i am uh, you know so he says uh, i know where i came from and i know where i am going uh, because i am from heaven not from the earth so because i am from heaven i have superior knowledge to you i know more than uh, you know uh, you people who have only a human limited mind but because i am from heaven i know things and i can say things which um, are which go beyond the requirements of needing a witness and all of that so he says that he says i can give my own testimony because i am not from here i am from heaven and i know all things but then after that he again uh, you know uh, refers to the father as a witness okay so he does use that uh, argument as well later um, mm, oh, that would be verses 15 to 18 uh, if we could just have someone very quickly read out those verses 15 to 18 we will uh, comment on that and then we will take our break 15 to 18 12 you judge according to the flesh i judge no one yet even if i do judge my judgment is true for it is not i alone who judge but i and the father who sent me in your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true uh, was 18, 18? I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. Yes. yes. So, so Jesus says over here, um, the in your law in verse seventeen, in your law it says that if two witnesses are saying something, then it is accepted as true. And over here, it's not just two human witnesses who are saying something. The father is saying this about me, that what I am saying is true. And uh, I myself who have come from heaven, I'm giving my witness. So if two human witnesses are adequate, then two divine witnesses are most definitely adequate. And you should accept what I am saying as true. And moreover, he points out in verse um, uh, 16, uh, um, okay, verse, verse 15, he says, you judge by human standards, I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the father who sent me. He is saying, no, I never do any judging on my own. I always depend on the father and do it in line with what he I know wants done. And so he is saying, my judgment and my testimony and my witness is always accurate because I do it in line with what the father wants. I am not acting on my own. Uh, so in this way, uh, Jesus supports uh, his argument that he has a right to declare that he is the uh, light of the world. Okay, So maybe we can go for our break and then uh, resume, you know, the verses after that so let's take a quick break thank you <laughs> 